We now come to the debate on HS2 compensation. Theo Clark. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have called this debate on HS2 compensation as I am concerned at how my constituents in Stafford are still being treated by HS2 Limited, and I wish to raise their serious complaints to the Rail Minister directly and to hear what he is going to do to address them. Since the Prime Minister made the decision to cancel Phase 2 of the High Speed Rail 2 project from Birmingham to Manchester, many of my constituents have been left in limbo with no information as to what is happening with either their properties or land. Yep. I know this is an issue affecting numerous constituencies, yep. and can I thank the many colleagues from across the House who are here to support this important debate today, including many of my neighbours in Staffordshire, including the members for Litchfield and South Staffordshire, and also the member for Stone. Today I'm calling for all outstanding HS2 compensation claims to be resolved. I wish to set out a number of examples in my own constituency, which demonstrate that the issue of HS2 compensation is still a long way from being concluded and must be dealt with by the government. Let me start by thanking the constituents who have contacted me, sharing their stories and highlighting how HS2 is deeply affecting them. I also want to highlight that several other constituents who had previously asked me to raise their case have now asked me today not to mention them by name. I am outraged to discover they have been intimidated uh, by HS2 to do this. Disgraceful. In one surgery appointment, I was told, quote, it will not be good for you to get your MP involved as that would be bad for your case, end quote. This is completely unacceptable yeah. behaviour by HS2 Limited, and I wish to call this out today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also... I'll give away on that point. I mean, that, uh, declaring interest, uh, uh, and not in this case, but declaring interest as a farmer, and I understand this, you have been contacted by some in the National Farmers Union in, in relation to it. Does the member ever not agree that the demand, uh, to demand land from farmers and not to compensate them quickly and effectively can never be acceptable? Does the Honourable Member agree that if a farmer can show loss of earnings, they should also receive compensation for that, as at this moment I understand they don't? Uh, the Honourable Member is absolutely right. And if you can bear with me, I'll be coming on specifically to compensation for farmers and the NFU's points uh, later in my speech. Uh, let me make some progress and I'll give away in a moment. Um, I want all of those seeking compensation to know that you have not been forgotten that is why I am speaking up for you all today, to ensure that your views are being heard at the highest levels of government. Since being elected as the member for Stafford, I have already raised the issue of <coughs> HS2 compensation six times in this House. Mm. Six times, <coughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, and I have still not had all of my outstanding local claims resolved. This is not acceptable, and the behaviour of HS2 to my residents has been shocking. In addition, I've contacted numerous relevant ministers. I've spent hundreds of hours working on this issue, visiting affected constituents and advocating for them. Indeed, my very first piece of casework as a new MP involved a constituent who experienced the most awful mental health crisis because of the stress of the compensation process. And on this particular case, can I thank the member for Pendle, who worked with me constructively as the former minister for rail. And I do appreciate that the current new minister has also met with me recently to discuss these issues. When the Prime Minister announced back in October last year that the Phase 2 of HS2 north of Birmingham would be cancelled, I welcomed this, as I believe for a long time that HS2 was a folly. In November, the Prime Minister also stated, we are committed to fair treatment for people affected by the changes to HS2. Well, I applaud the Prime Minister's sentiments. There absolutely should be fair treatment for all of those affected by the changes to HS2. So I ask today, will the Minister ensure that HS2 Limited will pay compensation fairly? This is the crucial question, and one made even more pressing when you read the Secretary of State's comments back in October, when he said, I think that those affected by HS2 have been properly compensated according to the law. I'm sorry, that is not the case. Yep. And I will go into some more details about why there has not been proper compensation in several instances. When HS2's route was announced over a decade ago, the value of property and land along the route immediately dropped. 
the land and properties had become blighted and we had to set up a very complex compensation system. Those going through the process were advised to hire private agents to assist them through the negotiating process. And the complexity of this process has meant that I've heard from numerous people that they were offered far smaller amounts of money as compensation than their property was actually worth because of HS2. This process is not only complex, <coughs> but the process is also extremely slow. I'm now being told that those living along the cancelled phase two route who wish to repurpose their property are now purchasing at a far higher cost. This is clearly unacceptable. Why on earth should we be penalising residents who've already been forced to sell their property and land due to the government building a railway line through their homes? Would my honourable friend give way? Yes, I'll give way to my honourable friend. Thank you very much for giving way. Um, yes, I have a constituency, Ms. a constituent, Mr Deputy Chairman, called Sean Froggart, and he had a compulsory purchase order made against part of his farm, and that involves land to which he can, it's the only way he can get access to his farm. Now, three times he has petitioned HS2 to buy the thing back, but they're saying, no, it's now going to go on to the open market. How can this be right? And I hope the minister will address this. How can this be right when now the railway line isn't even going to go alongside and he's willing to pay back <coughs> the money anyway for his land, which was compulsorily taken off him. Well, my honourable, my honourable friend makes an extremely important point, and I absolutely agree with everything he's just said. And if you allow me to give my own example of a constituent in a very similar situation, I'd like to raise now the example of Andrew Collier, who is a farmer in Stafford, farming 650 acres. HS2 purchased just over half of his land, and some of this land was earmarked for utilities. The land was taken before harvest time, and he asked HS2 Limited for permission to harvest his crop. They said they would allow him to do this, so the crop was harvested. But then HS2 Limited gave the crop to someone else and then did not pay him for it. Uh. So Mr Collier applied for compensation, hoping that it would swiftly arrive. Of course, this did not happen. Instead, Mr Collier waited for two and a half years for HS2 to compensate him. Let me repeat that for the Minister. He waited two and a half years to be paid. And even now, he still owed hundreds of thousands of pounds to cover two years of lost harvests and other outstanding claims. <coughs> he tells me that two members of his family who worked on the farm have now had to leave because the remaining farmland is too little for them to work on. And due to the compulsory purchase of his land and due to the long delays in receiving compensation, he told me in his surgery appointment that his farm is now no longer financially viable. Compounding these issues, his sacrifice is now seemingly in vain because HS2 and Phase 2 has now been cancelled and the land is lying fallow. So that's why this debate today is so important to raise this issue. There is a fundamental lack of transparency and fairness in this entire process and I believe it's causing real harm to my constituents. How HS2 Limited deals with compensation appears to be completely divorced from practical realities on the ground. <coughs> I want to now turn to another example in a local golf club. Their course is in the middle of the countryside in my constituency and club members were devastated when they heard that the HS2 route would cut straight through the middle of it. So what is to happen now? Similarly, my constituents Jean and Trevor Taberner own a farm. HS2's route meant that their farm would be spared, but their farmhouse was demolished. Their new farmhouse is nearly completed, and they have been seeking the last instalment of money to finish the work. And as we all expect, this needs to be finalised as soon as possible, so that they can complete the construction of their home. However, they're facing delays in this, and now the line has been cancelled, HS2 are trying to place restrictive clauses upon them, quote, in perpetuity, just for them to receive what they are owed. These clauses are clearly so that HS2 can maximise the value of their assets. HS2 Limited are quite literally the only thing standing between them and their new home. 
So again, I asked the Minister, what is going to happen to resolve this? This is affecting people's lives and we simply cannot wait any longer for an answer. Yeah, yeah. I want to turn now to businesses affected and in particular how unsuitable the compensation process is for farmers. Uh, my right honourable friend, the Minister, in our recent meeting has recognised that there are specific issues relating to farmers. And I note that in his response to the Honourable Member for Buckingham, he's publicly stated that of the land that HS2 has, about 81% has been <coughs> let back out to be able to be utilised. And I want to make sure that we can better understand from the farming community what can be done with the land that is no longer needed. So can I thank the Minister for those words? And I do know that he has met with the National Farmers Union, as indeed have I in Staffordshire, and others to better understand these issues. But the point I wish to raise is this. If land is unused, and if it is not preserved in the state it was on the day before farming ended, it will start to slowly deteriorate. This means, particularly for cropland, that land being returned to farmers will have to be rehabilitated currently at the farmer's expense. So when you consider farmland, it is clear that the compensation process is causing major financial issues by depriving farmers of the land they farm and the ability to forward plan. I've also come off examples of constituents who have not yet reached an agreement with HS2 Limited when the Prime Minister made his announcement. So can I also ask the government to not forget about those residents who also need to have their compensation to be resolved. Next, I want to move to how HS2 Limited proposed to dispose of Phase 2 land. And following the cancellation of Phase 2, they have consistently told residents and business owners that they must act to ensure value for money for taxpayers. Well, of course, as a Conservative, I support this in principle, but value for money in this context appears to mean shortchanging those mm. from whom they are purchasing land and property. And the issue with this proposal is simple. HS2 Limited are focusing purely on ensuring they receive the highest price for the land and the properties that they have compulsorily purchased. But there appears to have been little thought to those whose land has been taken off them and wish to have it back. Yep. And I know that the NFU have highlighted this issue. They are calling for a more simple and cheaper process for returning land. Yeah, and fair. I very much support that. As part of this process, most property and landowners who had their lands compulsorily purchased will be offered the right <coughs> to first refusal under the Critchell Down rules. However, the value of the land will naturally be higher than when it was blighted and will be higher because land and property prices have increased in general. Farmers in particular and all those affected are telling me they are now having to buy back their own land at far higher amounts. I believe this is unfair and I would like the Minister to look at this again. Yeah, yeah. Also, if the right to first refusal is not taken, what will happen to that land and property? Someone will purchase it, and particularly in farmland, there is an additional danger that developers and land bankers might be keen to buy it, which would completely transform the makeup of former rural communities. Let me add that there is a serious lack of transparency from HS2 throughout all of this. I was shocked to read recently that the chief executive of HS2 Limited revealed that the cost of phase one has already increased by yeah. 10 billion to 66.6 billion. What a horrific waste of taxpayer money. Yeah. Finally, I want to raise the importance of the Handsacre Link. This would bring compatible HS2 trains to Stafford. It was advertised as the reward to the people of Stafford for enduring so many years of issues associated with this project. It would ensure that phase one is completed and a lot of the works already constructed are underway. I have raised this rail link before, back in April last year, and I was assured by the Secretary of State for Transport that the works would continue to progress. However, I now hear rumours that this rail link is to be cancelled. This would not only be a betrayal of my constituents, a waste of time and resources put into construction already completed, but also, and this is a key point, it would be a breach of the legislation which specifies that this <coughs> rail link must be built. So can the Minister reassure my constituents that the Handsacre rail link will be completed? So in conclusion, Mr Deputy Chairman, this debate is important because my constituents are still living in uncertainty. 
the processes surrounding HS2 compensation are flawed, HS2 continues to behave disgracefully. So finally, can I invite my right honourable friend, the Minister for Rail, to visit me in Stafford, please, to talk directly to my constituents to see firsthand how the delays, the lack of fair payments is affecting them, and to commit today to doing something about this. This issue of HS2 compensation must finally be resolved. Yeah. Question is, as on the order paper, Sarah Green. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. May I begin by expressing my thanks to the Honourable Member for Stafford for securing today's debate. As other members may know, parts of my constituency of Cheshire and Amersham lie directly above the HS2 tunnels in the Chiltern Hills, where the tunnel boring machines are due to surface. Particularly affected have been those living near the five vent shafts near Chalfont St Peter, Chalfont St Giles, Amersham, Chesham Road and Little Missenden. For some of them, the impact has been so severe that they felt unable to continue living in their homes. Decisions to move, never taken lightly, have invariably brought them into contact with HS2's various compensation schemes. I therefore wish today to focus on the experiences of constituents with one particular scheme for special circumstances or atypical properties. This scheme was set up in recognition that there may be some residents and businesses near the, near the HS2 route who need assistance despite not meeting the eligibility requirements of other schemes. The first case I'd like to share is that of a constituent who lived in close proximity to one of the vent shafts. They experienced the construction of a hall road immediately outside their property, where once there'd been a country lane used largely by local residents. Now there was a large road with HGV traffic travelling up it night and day. In addition, a three metre high embankment was constructed immediately in front of their house, ruining their view, their privacy and the value of their property. Faced with at least another year of construction work and permanent blighting of their property, they reluctantly decided to seek compensation from HS2 <coughs> that would allow them to move. They had this to say about their experience. Dealing with HS2 and its contract partners has been a nightmare. They will not properly engage regarding compensation and on other matters they continually delay answering questions, provide incorrect and contradictory information, change their plans without proper notice or consultation, and have no regard for the well-being of the community. They block all attempts at proper dialogue, ignore questions, and hand matters to different teams to delay things further. If we complain, we might get a half-hearted apology for the time taken to respond at all, but <coughs> nothing changes. Thankfully, after much stress and inconvenience, the government did eventually buy this constituent's property at unblighted value under the special circumstances or atypical property scheme. But the truth is, it should never have been this hard. The delays, contradictory information, changing of plans at short notice and half-hearted apologies led to unnecessary delay, distress and upset. And it, it doesn't have to be that way. The, case, the second case I'd like to briefly share involves constituents who moved to their home in 2007, so two years before HS2 was announced. Where previously they enjoyed starlit nights, they now faced floodlights on at all hours. The disturbance and upheaval took a toll on this constituent's mental health, resulting in them making the dis difficult decision to sell their home. HS2 initially sought to steer the couple towards the need to sell scheme, which would have forced them to sell their property at market value, as opposed to the considerably higher unblighted value. After much wrangling, including intervention from, from my office, HS2 agreed to consider the couple as an atypical case. But part of the problem, of course, was that there's no formal application process. And this is part of the problem. The process itself is opaque. Unfortunately, HS2 agreeing to consider my constituents as an atypical case was in many ways just the beginning. The couple emphasised how degrading the process to finally being accepted was. Despite providing GP and support worker details to HS2 more than once, they continued to receive repeated requests for ever more information, with each request bringing up renewed worry and stress. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, whilst both the cases I've re referenced here today eventually did result in the individuals being accepted onto the special circumstances or atypical property scheme, the process to get there was protracted, stressful and awful. And that's the thing I want to highlight today. These schemes need to be administered swiftly, fairly and with compassion. And I sincerely hope the Minister will reflect on those experiences and that lessons can be learned to ensure that those affected can get speedy resolution and be treated with the dignity and respect they deserve. To start off by uh, congratulating my honourable friend in securing this debate, and we've already heard from just the first two speakers about how people's lives have been impacted as a result of this scheme. I think so many of us, uh, right across Staffordshire, were so delighted when we heard the news back in October that the Prime Minister had taken the right decision in terms of cancelling phase two of HS2. This is something that uh, many of us have been campaigning for and we were so delighted to hear yeah. this news. Yeah. Already in the time, the HS2 had spent £208 million pounds on purchase of land for phase 2A alone. And that's even before the major construction work was to start on this. And actually, there was a hope and a belief that this would be, uh, the land that had been purchased would be returned to the owners and this would all be resolved incredibly quickly. But I'm afraid to say that even though this announcement was made in October, there still remains an enormous amount of uncertainty, an enormous amount of concern and a total lack of clarity for so many people who are impacted by this scheme. So as the new year begins, we need to have clarity as to when land is going to be returned. We need to have an understanding as to when the selling of land by HS2 is to start. Uh, we need to have an understanding about those people who've had their homes taken from them. Uh, when are they going to be in a position to maybe buy back their homes? When are they going to be in a position to know what the rules are and what their future may hold? Um, I appreciate that the Minister has just today lifted the safeguarding on Phase 2A. This is something that I think all of us very, very much welcome. But it still leaves large areas of clarity, uh, uh, large areas of many, many questions that do need urgent clarity. Um, and I understand that the Department has said the return of land will take time because the Department for Transport needs to make sure that the programme provides value for money for taxpayers and does, does not disrupt local property markets. It also says there remains a significant amount of work to do. I'm sure there is a significant amount of work to do. But there has been a considerable period of time to do that work. And people's lives are on hold. Their mental state is... Their, their nerves are being frayed. But, of course, so many people just don't know what their future holds. And they cannot move on until the minister and HS2 give them the certainty and the clarity that is required. I wanted to just touch on a couple of examples uh, that have been sent to me. And there is, sadly, a lot of fear among many Staffordshire residents about how HS2 acts. They act sometimes in quite an imperious manner, without actually necessarily the care and the consideration or the consistency that you would hope a government-owned organisation would act. If I can give an example of a farming business. Temporary possession started in 2022, with HS2 taking around three acres for environmental mitigation. The family objected to the land being taken on a temporary basis as they didn't want to be responsible for the future maintenance of all the things that were being put on there. Further grazing land, approximately 100 acres, was taken under temporary possession in January 2023. When, and then a proportion of this land was purchased in July 2023. 
Meanwhile, preparation for the diversion of a high-pressure gas main began in March 2023. Fencing was erected, um, uh, hundreds of metres of hedges were ripped out, and a compound was built before, before work was halted in May 2023. Following the announcement of Phase 2A's cancellation, uh, they expected the compulsory purchase order would be cancelled and that the land returned. However, further land was purchased in November 2023, and last time I checked, November definitely came after October. Um, and so uh, this was after the Prime Minister had announced that this scheme was not continuing. So what are the impacts on these farmers? Well, they're considerable, because HS2 has a very under different understanding about the concept and the idea of purchase of land, Mr Deputy of Speaker. Now, if any of us in this place or any of our constituents wants to purchase land, we usually enter into an agreement and then we usually pay money. And after we've paid the money, we then maybe get the land. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, it works very differently for HS2. They can purchase land and never pay for the land. And not only do they have the indignity of not being paid for the land, they then um, have the issue of having to work around HS2, who are never going to be building anything on the land. So you have a business, a farmers, with a 400 cow dairy unit. Because of the infrastructure and because of all the changes that HS2 have made about removing access to parts of the grazing area, they have difficulty moving around livestock, they have difficulty in accessing land that they have never been paid for or that the uh, HS2 have taken temporary possession of. And all of this is creating additional workload and they haven't been compensated. And they are not clear as to when this will happen. And another example of a small nursery business, a nursery business who is dependent on making sure that they get uh, people knowing where they are. Well, of course, HS2 have uh, taken, uh, have put a charge through the land registry on the land. They won't allow them to cut the hedges that HS2 now own, but have never paid for. But they're willing to charge these people at an incredibly high rate the freedom for them to sort of cut these hedges down in order for people to know where their business is. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is not the way that we expect a government-owned company, a company that's owned not by some multinational, but by the Secretary of State for Transport, for it to be able to proceed. And I wonder if the, uh, the Minister, if I pass on the contact details and the detailed information of these two individuals, whether he would make sure that these cases are closely looked at and resolution is found. There are so many quotes that have been sent to me about the way that HS2 has conducted itself, the delays that people have had to suffer, the uncertainty, the fact that they have literally had to put their hand into their own pockets and spend tens of thousands of pounds paying land agents, paying consultants to try and get some money back from HS2, but still they have not received anything. So many people who've had land taken off them that they now no longer own but never received a single penny for. We need to have clarity. We cannot wait months and months more. I hope the minister, who I know is an incredibly diligent and caring minister, will give clarity today, or at the very, very minimum, give a clear timeline as to when Everyone who has been impacted by HS2 is going to know the rules that HS2 are playing by and make sure there's fairness for those people in Staffordshire who've been impacted by this. Yeah. Andrew Bridgen. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I commend the Honourable Member for Stafford for um, getting permission for this debate today. And I look at the motion before the House uh, that this House calls on the Government to provide compensation to people who have been affected by the construction of HS2. Well, I, I take a little exception at the construction, Mr Deputy Speaker. I think there's been a lot of cost, a lot of uh, injury, but, uh, uh, especially to the taxpayer, but certainly in my constituency, which has been affected for 22 miles with blight for uh, <coughs> over a decade, 
Uh, there's, uh, there's plenty of injury and need for compensation, but there was, there was actually never any, any construction. HS2, as the house knows, the high speed rail system, uh, the second project, was uh, initiated by the then Labour government prior to the 2010 election. I think it was Lord Adonis's little pet project. I think he formulated it on the back of a fag package, a gimmick for the 2010 election manifesto for the Labour Party. And unfortunately, George Osborne picked it up and, and ran with it. Would it is. I certainly, I certainly would give way. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Does he know that before Lord Adonis got his grubby hands on it, a design was made for HS2, designed by Arab Consulting, it would have connected with HS1, it would have gone into major transport hubs like Birmingham New Street and Manchester Piccadilly, which HS2 did not do, and it would have meant you could have gone from Manchester Piccadilly direct to France without any changes at all. And you know what? It would have been cheaper as well because there'd have been no tunnelling through the Chilterns. I thank uh, the right honourable gentleman for his intervention. If we were going to have a debate about the many failings of HS2, I think we may need more than the time we've got allowed today. And that uh, will be for a another debate. And I'm no doubt that lessons have been learnt by the government, if they always have. Um, they've been very expensive lessons uh, indeed uh, for the taxpayer. So we know, we know what HS2 is, the white elephant that got ever bigger on, uh, on taxpayers' money. I think I, I had opposed the project before it even started. I voted against it on every opportunity and spoke against it uh, for, a, for a, 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 de a decade. Uh, but uh, the elephant got uh, ever larger. Um, when we when phase 2B was finally uh, dispatched, um, I think my constituency uh, led a, a collective breath of relief. And the debate today is about HS2 compensation, and the phrase compensation is defined as uh, an award, normally money, paid in recognition of loss, suffering and injury. And although my constituency, we didn't have any construction of HS2, but we certainly had plenty of loss, uh, injury uh, and suffering. We had uh, 10 years of blight. An area, twice two, two widths of football fields, the whole length of the constituency, 22 miles, sterilised. Countless houses were never built. At least one factory at the lounge coal washing site had to be cancelled. That would have created 1,200 jobs. And we've had this blight for 10 years. My constituency is fortunate. We have a, the, highest, the highest economic growth in the country. But that economic growth and prosperity would have been far better without the blight of all that land through the middle of the constituency for more than 10 years. I don't know what, cons what, what compensation is the minister going to offer my constituents, some of whom went to their graves. And the biggest worry they had in their life was that HS2 was supposed to be going through their back garden. I reassured them that it was never going to happen. Despite all the bowl and bluster from the government, they was always going to run out of money. And in 2013, when the route was announced, I said, this is going to end up over £100 billion. It's in Hansard. And the House laughed. And they were right to laugh, because it wasn't £100 billion, was it? It was £160 billion at its peak. And the right on the gentleman for, for Litchfield is quite right. You know, it's a project that was going to seamlessly move people around the country. But because they couldn't afford to ever get it into city centres because of the burgeoning cost of the project, it was a project that very quickly ended up being from take, aiming to move people from nearly London to nearly Birmingham. And if it had proceeded on, it had gone to nearly Manchester. Well, I personally didn't know anybody that wanted to go from nearly London to nearly Birmingham, but the project had to continue. So it blighted my constituents. And I want to talk about one community in northwest Leicestershire. The village of Meesham, which was actually the most highly affected settlement on HS2. There was nowhere south of there on the planned route that was affected by the number of houses and the number of businesses that were going to be disrupted without mitigation, without any mitigation. So HS2 went in there and we had, knowing it was one of the most deprived communities in my constituency, we had a regeneration plan working with a, a, a fantastic company 
uh, called Misham Land, where 450 desirable new houses were going to be built in the middle of the village on some wasteland, and that was going to fund bringing back the canal, a regeneration project, including two aqueducts, working with the Ashby Canal Trust to bring the canal back to Misham, have a cafe culture around a, a large basin where people would bring, at the end of the, the, the current development of the canal system, bring their longboats, and that was a key. Huge, huge investment in, in the village until HS2 was announced, and that, that, the route went straight through the middle of the Misham land site. And for 10 years, that regeneration of Misham has been delayed. And I'm not sure what that, so they've suffered, the people of Misham have suffered loss uh, and injury, but I mean, where's the compensation? Okay, it's gonna go ahead now, but it's 10 years delayed. That project would have been completed. So, so the, the, there's, there's certainly huge aspects of that all the way along the route. And it won't be just in my constituency we've seen that. Who else has been injured? Well, I would maintain to the House, and I'll declare an interest, I'm probably the only Member of Parliament at the service house to HS2. A house which I bought in 2011. It was a substantial um, Georgian uh, rectory uh, with outbuildings, 14 acres of grounds with it, and I was forced by a judge to sell it under the Extreme Hardship Scheme. And I sold it in 2015 to HS2. Now, being a Member of Parliament, I thought, I can't deal with HS2 myself, so I'll employ some consultants to deal with it. So it's an arm's length transaction. And they charged me £25,000. Took 18 months. And I went through the system, and I saw the system. And I explained to the government afterwards how HS2 has swindled everybody along the line with their property prices. And I'll explain to the House how it's done. And it appears a transparently fair system. But I can assure honourable and right honourable members, if you consider it and the psychology behind it, it most certainly is not. So anybody along the whole route is presented with the same options. HS2 wants to buy your property or you have to sell your property for various reasons, whether it's land or a factory or a dwelling. You will be offered by HS2 a list of 10 valuers. The valuers will be main London uh, estate agents who you will have no, contact, uh, no knowledge of. You may know the names, There's some of the, the very big estate agency companies were on that list of 10 valuers, but there would have been the London offices, which is very unlikely that anybody in the Midlands or the North would have ever had any contact with those. And you would be asked to choose one of those to value your property, and HS2 would choose another, which sounds pretty transparently fair. They would both come to your property or land or your factory and they would come and do a valuation and if they're within 10 percent of each other hs2 said then we just split the difference and we'll call that the valuation now on paper that sounds very fair doesn't it but think about the psychology of it those 10 valuers are the valuers for the whole route they'll only ever work for an individual who chooses them at random because there, no one has any or she has any knowledge of whatsoever. It's a purely random choice. And at choosing that value, you've done all you can for them. They'll get paid their fee from HS2 for doing the valuation. But what they all on that list want to be is the valuer that gets chosen every time by HS2. And I put it to you, given the, the pressure and the burgeoning costs of the project and the evidence given by whistleblowers who've left the land procurement side of HS2, which of the valuers do honourable and right honourable members think HS2 is going to choose on the next occasion? The valuer who puts in the highest price to buy my house and land from me, or the valuer who puts in the lowest price to put for my property or land, or any property and land? And that is the fact that the system used by HS2 was always going to drive down land and property prices paid for those affected by the route. And it's provable, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that is exactly what it, it did. And there have been two notable whistleblowers who've left HS2, and I've spoken to both of them over the years. The, the director of HS2 was Doug Thornton. He, uh, his mate, mate was put in charge of 
planning and performance. And he was later put in charge of a £2.8 billion project to acquire all the land and properties that were needed along parts of the route. And he went back to HS2 and said, £2.8 billion is not enough. You can't make a budget and just say, well, we're just going to buy all that land and building for £2.8 billion. He said it was near a £4.8 billion. But he was told that he had to buy them for that price. So what does that sound like? As if HS2 was ever paying a fair price for the properties it needed to acquire uh, uh, along the route. And also there was a recently, and I've spoken to, to this gentleman as well, Andrew Bruce, who uh, was in charge of, of buying land and properties for HS2 until 2016. And uh, he had told his superiors that they had never paid the right amount of price, the fair market price, for any of that land and buildings that he bought while he's been there. And uh, he was asked to shred a, re a report uh, that, that he'd done that went to that. So, and um, I know also these two whistleblowers, they've suffered loss and injury as well, because I'm told that they were unable to get another job in the industry after they whistle blew on the practices that they'd experienced in HS2. So I think they might need some compensation as well, because I think we should protect whistleblowers, because without things like that, we still have, have a continuation of the, uh, of the, HS, of, of the, uh, the Horizon Post Office scandal. So I, I, I would maintain that uh, individuals, uh, communities have been damaged by HS2, and I'd be very interested to know what compensation the village of Meacham is going to get, and what we're going to do for every householder and every landowner along that route that I can prove to not get the right price for it. Now, the Minister has promised me a meeting twice in the last two months, and I still haven't got the date for it. I, I really do hope he's going to come, going to come, through, going to come through, through for me. Um, so, and with that, Mr Speaker, I hope lessons will have been learned by HS2 and the government. And I think it's, you know, it's a week of scandals, whether it's the Horizon Post Office, the loan charge, or HS2, this government has not covered itself in glory. Order. Order. Can I point out that there are three members plus the front benches still wishing to speak? Debate has to end at five o'clock. I urge brevity upon colleagues. Dr. Karen Mullen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I want to begin by congratulating my friend for my own friend for securing this important debate and for advocating for her constituents. Then my remarks will show I'm considering this topic from a slightly different but equally important angle. I'm here to press the government to compensate Crewe in light of the cancellation of HS2 from Birmingham to Crewe and then on from Crewe to Manchester. To begin with, I hope the House will indulge me, Mr Deputy Speaker, because for medical reasons I was not on the estate when we returned from recess following the announcement by the Prime Minister regarding HS2. I made clear my opposition to the decision at the time, but the decision has now been made, so I won't spend time rehearsing the arguments, and I recognise I'd be heavily outnumbered today uh, on that particular front. But I do want to place on record the disappointment of my constituencies, constituents and local businesses. The arrival of HS2 to Crew represented a fantastic opportunity for the town to secure economic growth and improve connectivity on both an intercity and other rail travel. Crew has a positive future regardless, but there's no denying the supercharging effect HS2 coming to Crew would have had. I must reluctantly accept the government's decision and I recognise that other proposals that are now able to move forward as a result. As part of Network North, we will see increased funding for most existing major road network and local, large local major road schemes. These schemes can benefit from an uplift in government contributions from 85 to 100% of their costs, and increased funding will help to ensure the delivery of the schemes. It will also lead to over £700 million to fund a new wave of bus service improvement <coughs> plans in the north and an extra £3.3 billion to tackle potholes as part of a road resurfacing scheme. But there is no doubt that as things stand, crew has not been fairly compensated in light of the change plans. Local government in Cheshire, and Cheshire in particular, were encouraged to engage with and prepare for HS2's arrival. In fact, had they not, I'm sure they would have been subject to extraordinary pressure from central government to do just that. And regeneration funding given to the town, our town deal in particular, were calculated with a clear understanding that this other form of central government investment was happening. Cheshire East reports that it spent over £11 million in preparing for HS2 and the crew hub. This includes £8.6 million in the capital programme and £2.6 million of direct revenue expenditure. Whilst it wouldn't be for me to decide the wisdom of all that expenditure, line by line, 
that is a significant amount of money and predicated on repeated long-term commitments from central government. That was investment that was due to realise regeneration in Crewe, which it will not now achieve. That money could have been spent directly in Crewe in other ways that did secure regeneration. Of course, we can expect our share of the reallocated bus and road funding, but that is just the share we would have expected to get if HS2 was never coming to Crewe. A decision has been taken that the government argues a wider region will benefit from, but the government needs to recognise the financial impact on Crewe and step up to the plate. <coughs> I don't accept that Cheshire's can now blame the decision for all its financial woes. That's quite obvious political manoeuvring. And it is important that the lion's share of any funding goes to crew and not just used to fill the financial problems facing the wider council. But I do accept that the government must compensate us locally for the implications of its decision. We have a lot of positive things to talk about in crew. As I mentioned, we, had a, we have a town deal that's funding £22.9 million package of projects. That's funding that's regenerating and reopening the Flag Lane Bass as a community centre. That's funding a brand new home for the South Cheshire Amateur Boxing Club. And that's funding a new youth club, improved pocket parks and investment in empty shops and more. We also have £14 million from the Future High Streets Fund. But the economic value, both direct and associated with being a HS2 hub station, was a significant scale. And a return on bus and road funding was the shortfall that I pressed the government to look at. We know a number of the sites that got significantly bigger town deals and we know levelling up funding of a bigger scale has been made available to other places. That was not unreasonable in the context of HS2 coming to Crewe, but now it's not. Of course, I know the Rail Minister is only one part of the puzzle, but I hope across government there is recognition that movement is needed. So I'd like to ask the Minister to confirm the government's commitment to come forward with proposals to compensate crew over and above the money we'd expect to receive that all areas are getting based on the decision taken on HS2 and when that funding will be made available and how. When the dust has settled, the government should be able to demonstrate clearly that the impact on crew has been recognised not just with words, but with a clear investment of funding. That's the fair thing to do. I know the Minister recognises the obligation that any reasonable person would see exists. I would expect he is pressing the case, but time is moving on. What we need now are results. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I congratulate my honourable friend, Fort Stafford, for securing this important debate uh, that gives me an opportunity to continue, as I have done many times before in this chamber and on the Transport Select Committee, to detail the plight faced by landowners and small business owners alike, who, through no fault of their own, have been swept up in the seemingly endless and needless disruption caused by HS2 Limited and their contractors in my constituency. People who face losses and hefty legal bills, which have left many unprofitable, some facing near bankruptcy, all without the means to recoup their losses in any, see, any form of equitable way. I have heard time and time again of the inescapable, infinite loop of bureaucracy that surrounds what meagre compensation HS2 Limited is willing to cough up which in itself increases and prolongs my constituents' legal costs. One landowner has told me that her land agent is increasingly reluctant to take on more work as more and more of his bills, which under the Act are meant to be compensated by HS2's own agents, Carter Jonas, go unpaid. A couple in my constituency have been caught up in this legal quagmire, with HS2's insistence that their septic tank be replaced before the project purchases the property at a predetermined rate. What was supposed to be a relatively straightforward job turned into a multi-month process, preventing my constituents from selling their property at that agreed price, effectively leaving them short-changed, despite them simply following due process. They have yet to be compensated for the difference between the agreed value and the actual value of their property in the village of Quainton, which in one way or another has been continuously impacted by HS2's road closures. Yet another road closure is about to come into effect, this time for two years. This will devastate my constituents at Doddishall House, whose business will suffer from reduced access to and from the estate and require a lengthy diversion both for them and their clients. HS2 have not even attempted to offer them compensation. Or take, for our farmers, cattle loss, 
which has blighted numerous farms as a result of poor soil treatment and management by HS2's contractors, often operating right next door. One farmer has quoted a total loss of £37,000 as a direct result of HS2's shoddy practices. How, Mr Deputy Speaker, can this possibly be morally justifiable for the project? How can a hard-working family be left with such heavy losses? Then there is blackleg, a disease in cattle that is caused by bacteria released from disturbed soil. I'm aware of at least one case that the farmer has attributed to HS2's malpractice. It is noteworthy that farmers in this area have never seen a blackleg case before in Buckinghamshire, and no prizes, Mr Deputy Speaker, for guessing how much compensation has been offered for the avoidance of all doubt, absolutely zero. And it's not just farmers and landowners that suffer from being left out in the cold by HS2. Hundreds of road users across my constituency are forced to sit in endless congestion wherever HS2 decides to cut a tree down, closing whole roads in the process. Endless utility diversions, commuters, buses taking children to school, ambulances responding to life and death situations. They've all had their journeys repeatedly disrupted by HS2 with no recourse to any form of compensation. Whether it's the A41 through Wadston and Fleet Marston, whether it's uh, the, the villages near Wendover like Ellisborough and Butler's Cross, these endless, endless diversions are costing real people real money and real time and in some cases lives on a daily basis, no compensation. And that's before we even get to the state of Buckinghamshire's roads, destroyed by thousands of HGV movements linked to HS2 construction, causing endless damage to cars, to tyres, to suspension systems. Again, HS2, fingers in their ears, don't take any responsibility for that which they have broken in Buckinghamshire. Then briefly we come to businesses. Let me give the example of the Prince of Wales pub in Steeple Claydon. Now, Steeple Claydon sits right in the heart of HS2 disruption and destruction, uh, also very near the building of East West Rail. There are constantly roads closed in and out of that village, like Addison Road, closed for many, many months recently. That is costing that pub nigh on £1,000 a month in lost revenue. At one point, the landlord told me he was £65,000 down. There is no scheme, nothing out there at all to compensate businesses affected in this way. Real livelihoods challenged, the real viability of businesses challenged. I put that to a former chief executive of HS2 Limited, Mark Thurston, when he actually bothered to visit my constituency in May, and it is unrepeatable the language he used about that pub in this chamber in response. No sympathy, just saying that it was a expletive little pub that nobody would want to drink in anyway. That is not the attitude that we expect from anyone paid for by the state. Just next door in Steeple Claydon, got Langston and Tasker, which stands out amongst businesses affected by HS2 construction. They are a bus and coach operator hit hard by any road closure. They operate school runs. They take Buckinghamshire children to school on a daily basis. Yet the constant road closures, the state of the roads, the damage to their vehicles is costing them considerable amounts of money every single day, which ultimately gets passed on to Buckinghamshire Council and local council taxpayers. Do HS2 pay a penny towards it? No, of course they don't, but they absolutely should. Mr Deputy Speaker, I could go on with examples like this all afternoon, but I am very uh, aware of the time and others that wish to speak. And so my message to the Minister, who I know does listen and has visited my constituency and does want to get this right, is that we have got to do better. HS2 Limited have got to do better. The attitude needs to change. The practices need to change. They need to understand the real lives. They are absolutely devastating on a daily basis, be that people who own property or just trying to go about their daily lives, getting to work, get the kids to school, you know, who knows, maybe have some fun. They need to understand the impact that as the unwelcome aliens in Buckinghamshire, they are causing on a daily basis to build this railway. And my challenge to the Minister is let's get them the compensation 
that real people, my constituents and so many more, deserve. Sir Michael Fabricant. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to thank my honourable friend, my near neighbour for Stafford, for introducing this debate. We've heard a catalogue of problems from various colleagues here on both sides of the House. And the sad thing is they're not unique. They are repeated up and down the country. Now, you know, when I was a whip, I instituted a system, I'm looking at the WIP to see whether or not the system still operates, where we would look at our members of parliament to see how much staff or how many staff they got through over a short period, because there'd clearly be a problem if someone couldn't hold on to their staff for long. And we would think that that particular minister, or, or, or indeed uh, backbencher, uh, was seriously flawed in some way. How many chairmen and how many chief executives have HS2 gone through? And they've gone through a lot. And they've gone through a lot because they're flawed in a very serious way. They're dysfunctional. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Way, isn't it? Even more amazing. You've said they've gone through all these senior staff at HS2 and yet it's the highest paid role in the civil service? It's extraordinary, and it just demonstrates what an organisation this is. And it's an organisation which is not only dysfunctional, it's unfair. In an earlier intervention, I talked about my constituent, Sean Froggart, uh, who is not being allowed to reclaim uh, land that was compulsorily taken off him even though now the land isn't needed because the railway's not going ahead on phase 2A. Uh, I might add that the land was taken off him and he's still waiting to be paid. He's waiting to be paid and he's still not going to be able to reclaim this land. Now, I took the opportunity of looking at my cell phone during the debate not because I was looking at tractors or anything like that, but because I was doing some research about the Critchell Down Rules. And it says on the government's own website, the Critchell Down Rules require government departments to offer back surplus land to the former owner or the former owner's successors at the current market value. It's got to be offered back to the same people. Not only is it not being offered back at a reasonable price, it's often not being offered back to the same people. Now, look, I came in at the very last moment to speak in this debate, so I'm not going to take up a great deal of time. I will listen with interest, by the way, to the answer from the Minister, which I suspect might be the same as the answer he gave yesterday in a different debate regarding the Handsacre uh, junction, which happens to be in my constituency, but I would ask that in these dying days, and I think they are dying days in one way or another, of HS2, that the government gets a grip on them and make sure, just like in the previous debate, that justice is done for our constituents and that the sense of justice that we have in this nation <coughs> extends not only to HMRC, as in the previous debate, but in this debate, to HS2 Limited. Opposition front bench, Mike Kane. Uh, thank you, Sir Roger, and I congratulate the Honourable Member on securing this important debate today, and thank you for the Back Business Committee for uh, its time. Uh, and can I also thank Honourable Members Cheshire, Armish and South Staffordshire, North West Leicestershire, Crew and Nantwich, um, Buckinghamshire and Lichfield for contributing to the debate today. Uh, Sir Roger, the stories we've heard and those which have been reported over the years show very real consequences of this Tory HS2 fiasco. Oh, muttering from the benches opposite. If you don't have the civil service involved in cancelling that decision which the Prime Minister announced in Manchester, it was done on the back of a pack, fag packet which has been used today, all day, without the Department of Transport, no wonder you get this type of fiasco going on. 
Now, we have heard of the people having to leave their family homes they have worked hard for, the businesses having to pack up and leave their premises, the towns, the villages that having their homes targeted after they were bought and late, later left to rot, the farmers forced to move or not able to use the land for years because of more and more delays to HS2. Cash-strapped councils, as the member of Gruen Nampwich has said, £11 million Cheshire East have paid out to that. And I I commend uh, the Labour spokesman there, Conor A. Smith, on his campaign uh, to have the council uh, reimbursed for the money lost. The communities who have put their future on pause for years and the families who have found getting compensation to be painful and a drawn-out experience. And these lives and businesses disrupted for a decade. And for what? A now staggering 65 billion high speed train, which won't even reach these communities that have been impacted. A train which, according to the chair of HS2, will result in fewer seats, longer journeys for those travelling north of Birmingham. What a result for those living in these communities and across the north. And that is before we even consider how much taxpayers' money has been spent on this compensation. According to reports, almost £423 million has been spent buying up 420, uh, 424 properties on the western leg from Birmingham to Manchester. Another £164 million spent towards buying 530 blighted properties on the eastern leg to Leeds. And with the news today that the government is lifting the safeguarding on this land... Not content with cancelling high-speed rail to the north, the Prime Minister has now decided to salt the earth. If it wasn't uh, aware already, this must be the final nail in the levelling uh, up uh, coffin. Coffin, on, on, on that point. For giving way. Uh, would you be able to clarify as to whether, uh, if in the unfortunate and unlikely event there was a Labour government, they would reimpose safeguarding on uh, Phase 2A? Like... Napoleon out of Moscow, he's routed through the poisoned earth strategy with the lifting of the safe guarding uh, today. But we have, to be, we have to be responsible. We will have to see what the books uh, tell us if we are to enter government in the weeks or the months uh, to come. Now, 14 years of promises to the North and the Midlands, and in this desperate failing attempt to try and rebuild brand himself the Prime Minister as the change candidate at the next election, he decided to rush through an alternative plan at the party conference, as I've already said. A plan which mentions places such as Crewe, who would have been greatly benefited, as the member for Crewe and Nantwich rightly said. A plan which the Prime Minister later admitted was only illustrative. Only illustrative. The Networth North plan, Sir Roger, announced fantastic news for my constituency in Withenshaw and Say East, a new Metrolink line to Manchester Airport. It opened in 2016. That was the chaos and the confusion of that announcement. And for the Foreign Secretary, is not alone on his side in thinking this way. Two of former Chancellors warned the Prime Minister's actions of a huge economic self-harm, with the Tory Mayor of the West Midlands describing it as cancelling the future. A great line, if I may say so, to the Honourable Member for Litchfield. In what is a consistent theme for this government, this whole mess has been created by not consulting with the communities we have been discussing today or without speaking to our Metro mayors and without listening to the businesses across the country that were depending upon this project. Sir Roger, after 14 years, communities have had enough of the broken promises by this broken government. Labour will not repeat these mistakes, mismanaging major projects, turning people's lives upside down, taking their trust for granted, impacting their businesses and livelihoods and failing to deliver. I'm happy to give way to the Honourable Member. I'm listening carefully to what the Shadow Minister is saying. He's trying to say that a mythical future Labour government wouldn't disrupt people. Does he understand that building HS2 does devastate people's lives? Big infrastructure does devastate people's lives. There is not a way to do it without doing that. That's exactly why Labour would do it with the mayors, with the communities, and in, in consultation with the communities that it would have affected and impacted. Uh, HS2 was going to go under my back garden. That's my interest, Mr Deputy Speaker. Of course, to the... 
that yeah, Labour right. would do it. So can I just confirm that Labour is now saying it will bring back HS2 if they won the next election, just to be clear? Sorry, I just... For your, myself to the answer I gave to the Honourable Member for South Staffordshire, uh, and that's, that, that's, that re remains our position. That's why we, on this side, have launched an independent experts' review of transport infrastructure. Headed by industry leader Jürgen Meyer from Siemens originally to learn the lessons from this shambles and to ensure we deliver transport infrastructure faster and more effectively so, so communities aren't taken for a ride with nothing to show for it, which has been the case here. Sir Roger, today we have just heard a few of the many examples of people's lives being impacted by this Conservative HS2 scandal. And it is clear that communities are still paying the price for the delays of the past decade and the chaos of the past few months. I hope I I'll give away, of course. <laughs> he, he's being very generous, but would he, in his generosity, accept that if it hadn't been for Lord Adonis changing the original plan, it would have gone nowhere near areas like the Chilterns, it would have gone up a completely different route, been a connected railway and actually been probably quite worthwhile. I thank the Honourable Member for that uh, intervention, but after 14 years, seriously, those type of excuses were extraordinarily uh, uh, thin, if he doesn't mind me saying so. So, to the Minister, I hope in his response the Minister will outline what is being done to address this chaos. Costs are going up still after this decision was made in October. To make sure that those impacted, as has been well outlined by members today, receive the compensation they deserve. And to ensure the same mistakes are not made again and again in the future. I look forward to hearing the Minister's remarks and would like to once again restate my thanks to the member for Stafford for securing this debate today and all honourable members who have participated. Minister Hugh Merriman. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I would like to commend my honourable friend, the member for Stafford, uh, for securing this important debate. And can I also recognise all the contributions from uh, right honourable and honourable members uh, in this afternoon's debate. I will come to those uh, during the course uh, of my response. Mr Deputy Speaker, as the House will be aware, the Government laid a written ministerial statement this morning announcing the lifting of safeguarding directions along the former HS2 route between the West Midlands and Crewe. By lifting safeguarding, the Government is providing certainty to people along the former route of HS2A and making development easier, as HS2 Limited will no longer object to proposed development in the area to which the safeguarding directions had applied. But to be clear, the lifting of safeguarding does not in any way trigger the start of a sell-off of property already acquired by the Secretary of State. No land owned by the Secretary of State will be sold off uh, until we are ready. Safeguarding applies to land owned privately. The imposition of safeguarding on Phase 2A had hitherto protected HS2 from conflicting development from any private landowner. Safeguarding has now been lifted from Phase 2A, with one notable exception – the continued safeguarding of land close to the village of Hansacre, north of Lichfield in Staffordshire. This junction, which I know is dear to my hon. Friend uh, the Member for Stafford and, indeed, uh, the constituency MP, my hon. Friend the Member for Lichfield, is now an even more critical part of the HS2 infrastructure. It will allow HS2 trains to join the West Coast Main Line through a connection to the existing rail network. So I can indeed confirm that the Government remains committed to delivering the Hansacre connection, as we are committed to delivering HS2 Phase 1. From London to the Midlands, 140 miles of new railway is being built by thousands of engineers and construction workers at 350 active construction sites. At Euston, we are working with our development partner, Lenlease, to model an ambitious, redeveloped Euston Quarter to deliver thousands of homes and offices which will provide the financing for HS2 trains into central London. Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, returning to today's important announcement, this is further evidence that we are listening to businesses and residents along the former Phase 2A route, and we will continue to do so. So let me give further information as asked for by my right honourable friend, the Member for South Staffordshire, uh, and my honourable friend, the Member for Lichfield. 
we will amend safeguarding on the remainder of the Phase 2 route of HS2 from Crewe to Manchester and from the West Midlands to Leeds by the summer to allow for any safeguarding needed for Northern Powerhouse Rail. To the point made by my right honourable member for South, uh, my right honourable friend, the member for South Staffordshire, we will shortly design a programme for disposing of any property no longer needed for HS2, and will set out more details soon. I can confirm that any land and property acquired compulsorily for HS2 or via statutory blight, but which is no longer required, will be sold subject to the Critchell Down rules. These rules, as my honourable friend, the member for Litchfield, set out require government departments under certain circumstances to offer back surplus land and property for sale to the former owner or their successors at the current market value. I can therefore assure my honourable friend that we are ensuring that property is offered back at a fair price to original owners with first refusal. Uh, I'll give way on that point. Thank the Minister for giving way. He says that the properties that are acquired by HS2 now no longer required uh, will be sold at the current market price. But does he accept, as I've explained to the House, how HS2 did not pay the current market price or a fair market price at the time of acquisition of those assets? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I, actually, I know I'm due to be meeting uh, the Honourable Member. He said that I'd uh, de- declined to meet after two uh, uh, requests. Actually, he had a meeting in his diary yesterday, but he was unable to, to make uh, the meeting according to his office. So we've set it again for the 31st January. I will talk to him about the matters he raises. Uh, I know that the Department and the HS2 team have looked at it before and do not agree uh, with the conclusions that he's mentioned, but we will discuss when we meet uh, on the 31st. But as set out, Mr Deputy Speaker, by honourable f- uh, friends behind me and other honourable members who have spoken, property owners who have found themselves obliged to deal with HS2 Limited and their contractors have had a varied and, I would have to say, at times, an inconsistent experience. Those property owners are, understandably, less interested in what HS2 can or cannot deliver for transport and the wider economy. Their focus has instead been on seeking the compensation they are entitled to and navigating what must at times have seemed like an unequal relationship with HS2 Limited. Mr Deputy Speaker, I readily acknowledge how important it is that those owed compensation such as money for the purchase of their property or for expenses or costs associated with such transactions, are paid in as timely a manner as possible. I have always sought to impress upon the company and their agents that it is unacceptable that cases should drag on, which is of no benefit to anyone, certainly not the property owner and certainly not the taxpayer. And When it comes to paying owners for title to properties that they have in many cases sold unwillingly, it is only right that they should receive recompense in full and as fast as practicable. That said, each property transaction is unique and therefore presents its own set of circumstances. As many in this House will be aware, when negotiating and settling compensation claims, HS2 Limited follows the principles set out in the Compensation Code. There are also a number of discretionary schemes which offer further help to those not eligible under the statutory framework. In effect, they go above and beyond that framework. HS2 Limited must achieve a careful balance between meeting the needs of the claimant and delivering value for money to the taxpayer. The Compensation Code requires claimants to provide robust evidence for their claims. It is often when claimants are struggling to provide sufficient, suitable evidence that their claims that negotiations sorry that their claims that the negotiations become frustrated lead to delays. And I will, Mr Deputy Speaker, be frank. The extent to which claimants' agents provide suitable evidence or are willing to negotiate from a realistic standpoint varies considerably, and I found myself in the middle uh, of some discussions in constituents' homes to that degree. So it is important to understand that background as it helps to explain why, in some instances, property owners consider that they are having payments withheld. Late payments, when they do occur, are never acceptable, but they are the exception, our data shows, rather than the rule. Mr Deputy Speaker, property cases should be concluded as soon as practicable, within the constraints imposed by the balance of property owner and the taxpayer's interest. The evidence shows, and I will happily write to every honourable member and right honourable member who has taken part in this debate, that HS2 Limited is succeeding in closing down claims, uh, despite the considerable complexities those claims involve. However, I acknowledge that there are a number of impacted parties, and we have heard about many of them this afternoon. 
with whom HS2 Limited has not yet been able to reach agreement and where negotiations have become challenging. And as I mentioned, I have got myself involved in many of those cases to move them further along and challenge HS2 as to the position being taken. My hon. Friend, the Member for Stafford, is in that regard a tireless advocate for those cases which have arisen in her constituency, some of which she and I have previously discussed, as she mentioned. She has mentioned some in particular during this debate. I will write back to her with my latest understanding of where matters sit regarding her constituents, Mr and Mrs Taberner and Mr Collier. The same applies to other constituent cases named in this debate by my right hon. Member for South Staffordshire and for others. And with regard to the point around intimidation, and I say this as someone who chaired the Transport Select Committee, I believe that everyone should be able to give clear, frank, open and transparent evidence without fear or favour. So if there is any uh, evidence of intimidation, which of course I will look at, then I will make sure uh, that that is eradicated. I give everyone in the House uh, that assurance. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and as my hon. Friend, the Member for Buckingham demands, I am determined that HS2 Limited should continue to up their game in dealing with difficult and disputed cases, such as the ones that have been mentioned today and others that I am aware about. Let me touch on a few matters that other hon. Members, uh, right hon. Members, that I have uh, I've heard from today but haven't actually referred to. Um, so the hon. Member for Cheshire, uh, Chesham, I should say, and Amersham, um, referenced a number of cases. I am very happy, and I have met with her previously. Um, I know that she's a a tireless advocate on her constituents' behalf. I will meet with her again uh, to discuss uh, some of those cases. Um, I have touched on uh, the points made by the hon. Member for North West Leicestershire, and I will look forward to meeting with him and going through the points that, that he makes uh, uh, in today's debate. Um, my hon. Friend, the Member for Crewe and Nantwich, has been a tireless advocate of the benefits that HS2 could deliver to his constituency, and it is the one part of the country that I believe uh, needs particular mention. I spent uh, a morning with him uh, and the local councillors from Cheshire East looking at the potential, looking what that team had bought. Um, he it won't have escaped his attention that the local government minister, uh, my uh, honourable friend, um, has entered the chamber. We spoke uh, earlier on this week, the two of us, about the needs for crew. We also spoke with other colleagues. He's been a tireless champion uh, of the council and the predicament that they find themselves in. Um, myself and the local government minister will be meeting with uh, the team from Cheshire East. Uh, he's certainly welcome to join, uh, and we've made points to other colleagues. We are determined to help, and we will work together. I know the local government minister cares about these matters, and will work with us to do so. Um, and just with regards to the uh, Labour front bench position, uh, what I would say, gently, because he's a fellow football uh, player of mine uh, as well as a good friend, um, the Labour position does appear to keep changing. Uh, just last week, the leader of the opposition. Uh, went to Manchester to say that HS2 would no longer continue. Uh, that was slightly inconsistent to what we heard this afternoon. It may well be the case that many dispute the plan that we have in place, but the plan is not to go ahead with HS2 north uh, of Hansacre and instead to spend that money, the £36 billion, on projects across the country benefiting all cities across the north in particular uh, and the Midlands. That is the plan. What I think we'd all like to know, Mr Deputy Speaker, is what is Labour's plan? Is it going to deliver HS2, or if it's not going to deliver HS2 beyond the Midlands, is it going to commit to the £36 billion that this government is committing to levelling up? And I think we would all like that clarity, not least the constituents represented by all those behind. Uh, I won't be able to due to time uh, by the looks on Mr Deputy Speaker's face. Um, let me end with three final points. I thank you, my hon. Friend, the Member for Stafford, and all the other members in this place for tirelessly working on behalf of those affected by HS2 and the manner in which they engage with me, I am at your service. By, by welcoming and accepting my hon. Friend's kind invitation to visit Stafford, I will do so and before the spring is out. And thirdly, and in conclusion, to commit to do the best I can for those property owners impacted by HS2. This includes ensuring the timely payment of compensation, the urgency of which has been laid bare in this debate. Leo Clark to wind up the debate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, firstly, can I thank the Minister for listening to 
the extraordinary examples that we've heard this afternoon in the Chamber of how HS2 have behaved to our constituents. Can I thank in particular the members for Lichfield, Shashman Amersham, South Staffordshire, North West Leicestershire, Crewe and Nambridge and Buckingham for speaking this afternoon's debate. Um, I do welcome what the Minister has said. I welcome that you'll visit my constituency to meet with affected residents and in particular to write to all of us who have spoken in the debate today to have clear answers for the individual cases that we've raised. It's very clear from this afternoon's debate that there is still considerable uncertainty over HS2 and I welcome the Government is going to look again at resolving all allegations outstanding compensation claims. The question is, as on the order papers, the matter of their opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Petition.